As I'm waiting for my morning coffee to brew, I was thinking back to the first ride I did with Boyd Johnson on his wheels. We were at the Ballers Ride, a hilly, gravel road-filled ride in Virginia, where some folks were smashing rims and flatting tires left and right. But we had set ours up tubeless and finished two giant days of riding with no issues. Before he had designed those carbon rims and his complete wheels, Boyd Cycling started out as a custom wheel builder lacing together stock parts. It was something many wheel builders do, but his focus on customer service and great word of mouth helped him grow quickly. The impressive part of that? He's done it in a crowded field, in a changing industry, and against big, well-funded competition. So there are lessons here for anyone thinking they want to launch a product line with any of those challenges. Here's how he did it. Welcome to the Build Cycle, the podcast by Tyler Benedict that explores the startup stories and growth tactics of hundreds of entrepreneurs, plus his own tips and tricks learned over two decades of launching, running, and growing businesses, including BikeRumor.com, the world's largest and most popular cycling tech blog. If you're thinking of starting your own business, the Build Cycle will give you the tools and inspiration to do it right. Now, let's dive into this episode of The Build Cycle. Boyd, you started your namesake wheel company in 2009, so you've been at it for about eight years now. Um, how did you get started, and tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, well, it's uh, I've been racing my bike since I was 13 years old, so since 1993, pretty much. Uh, was fortunate enough to race full-time for about 10 years, professional for a few of those years, and uh, throughout my racing career, I had a chance to be sponsored by a lot of different wheel companies, so... I saw what made stuff good, what made stuff not so good, what we could do differently. And then in 2009, when I was done racing with DLP Racing, I launched the company. What was the, so the, the impetus for this was that you saw the ways you could make a wheel better? Is that right? Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I would actually, I've always been a wheel junkie. And so some of the wheels that I would get, I would actually take them apart, change the lacing pattern, change out the spokes that they were using. Uh, and I always wondered, you know, when the companies got the wheels back at the end of the year, what they thought about that. <laughs> did everybody ever say anything? Nope, never heard anything about it. All right. Now, did you, were you planting the seeds of this kind of business while you were still racing, knowing, hey, I'm going to retire soon, I'm going to do this? Or was it, ah, oh, crap, I'm retired, I could better find something to do? Well, I was never good enough to say that I was retired from cycling. Um, I've had a good time doing it. Uh, it was never really on my mind when I was racing to do that. Uh, when I was racing, I was coaching full time, and then I also worked as a product developer for the iBike Power Meters, and uh, just happened to start the company when I was done. How do, how do you happen into starting a wheel company? Uh, just I started looking at all the different manufacturers out of there. Uh, it was right about the time when, you know, there was that push of manufacturers started selling the stuff. Uh, looking for customers versus contracting out and uh, you know you re never really knew who the customers or who the manufacturers were so it just it happened to be good timing as to when you could start making the connections with the manufacturer explain that a little bit more I'm not sure I follow you yeah so it's uh, I guess it was you know we hear the the Alibaba website thrown about and uh, 2009 was right about when Alibaba started um, you know started up with uh, all the manufacturers advertising on there. I started making some connections, started ordering samples, and uh, realized there was a lot of good stuff, a lot of bad stuff, and just that we could end up you know, making wheels. Okay, so when you say manufacturer, you don't mean like Mavic had a connection with consumers. You mean like the actual factory in China or Taiwan or wherever producing Correct. a rim. Correct. Yeah, the the manufacturers, uh, the people actually making the carbon fiber, they started realizing that there was a market in the U.S. for you know smaller companies looking to be established. Okay, so you, you 
retired from racing, not from riding. And were you still continuing on with the coaching or something to pay the bills while you're kind of getting this wheel company going? Or Yeah, and uh, so I was uh, doing both of those jobs, and my wife was actually working sales at Hincapie Sportswear at the time. And uh, I told her that I wanted to start the company, and she pretty much told me, she said, well, I can pay the mortgage with my job, so have at it, have some fun. And uh, I was still making money through the coaching and through the iBike, and pretty quickly the company started taking off. Um, you know, it's, we didn't go to an overnight success story, but we made, a, we made enough to where about three months into starting the company, I convinced my wife to leave her very stable job and come on board. Wow, that's really fast. The, the wheels that you're building, so how long from the, the day you retired racing till you had your first wheel made? Uh, technically, I was still under contract, so <laughs> um, it was, uh, let's see, about September I started making the connections and uh, we started getting sample rims in uh, a few weeks later. Uh, we were using open mold parts when we first started. And so it wasn't like we had to specify exact rim shapes and materials and all that. Uh, we were very open about the fact we were using open mold stuff, uh, but that's what allowed us to get the very small quantities to start the business um, and to move forward. Okay, and so for the people who aren't familiar with open mold, it basically means it's a catalog item that anybody could order. Correct, and so it's, uh, it's the manufacturer does all the work to come up with the rim shapes. Um, and basically make the product, and then they're looking for uh, companies to buy it with a small minimum order quantity. Okay, so you're ordering rims, presumably hubs and yep. spokes, and then assembling them to create a wheel of your design, so to speak. Correct. We were almost like a custom wheel builder at the time. Uh, and was the plan always to do something bigger and create a, a branded wheel company, or... Yeah, Just and go with it. <laughs> with our timing being really good, um, we were a little bit ahead of the curve on this. And shortly after that, uh, a lot of other people were realizing it's fairly easy to order the parts and to start up a wheel company. Um, and we, you know, we always wanted to know what's going to differentiate ourselves. What are we going to do better? What are we going to do differently? When we started off using the open mold parts, it was just about price point and customer service, and that's what helped us grow. But as other players started entering the market, we said, okay, what's going to set us apart in terms of innovation? And that's when we started designing our own hubs and our own rims. Well, you are reading my mind with some of these questions because that's what I wanted to talk about in a minute is how you progress from the oval mold to that. But first, first off, with the, with the stock items that you were combining into your own wheel building, how did you find those suppliers? Uh, it would be a lot of sending emails back and forth. Um, it would be getting a lot of sample rims in, so ordering two or three rims from multiple uh, suppliers out there. And what we would find is actually, with all the different suppliers, a lot of times we would be getting the same rim. And we realized that there was a lot of trading agents trying to pass themselves off as manufacturers. And so then it just became finding a trading agent who could help us with um, you know, meeting the supply, uh, getting stuff to us, and getting consistent quality. Do you need to use those trading agents, or can you go, can you find your way directly to the manufacturer? You need to use a trading agent. Um, I mean, once you get to a certain level, you can go direct with the manufacturer, but you still need a good trading agent to help with logistics, ordering, and quality control, which is the biggest thing. So how do you find a good one? You got to go over to Asia. So it's, uh, you can do so much through email and all that, but uh, going over, uh, making the factory visits, um, meeting with different trading agents, uh, that's just how stuff has to get done. Did you, I think that's one of the points of like the Taiwan bike show or the Taipei bike show and some of the other trade shows there, is that how you meet these trading agents then or is there a... Usually there'll be an email introduction. Um, but how, and... how do you get that? email who do you go to to get the email introduction usually i get about three to four emails per day um, offering to sell carbon rims uh, even to this point now and so they're the trading agents will be out there looking for new clients um, most custom wheel builders will be getting the emails too and uh, 
So I think they get email lists from a lot of places. Right, but before you started even building custom wheels, you had to find the rims. That's like at the very beginning, before you were getting <laughs> these spammy emails. Yeah, at the very beginning, it was uh, sending a lot of inquiries on the Alibaba, Alibaba site and uh, finding it that way. And we found you know some good, some bad, and uh, just a lot of uh, multiple trading agents selling the same product. Okay, and then so now you've been doing wheel building, custom wheel building, using mm -hmm. these open mold parts for how long before you started making or designing your own <clears throat> rims? So we started uh, really going, 2010 is when uh, my wife came on full time, we were doing this as a full time job and in 2011 uh, we decided that's when we really needed to differentiate ourselves from all the other open mold uh, companies that were being started. Um, we wanted to set ourselves apart in terms of rim shape, uh, aerodynamics, and then being able to be in control of the materials going in, uh, signing contracts with the actual manufacturers through our trading agent. Right. And so that, to me, opens up a lot of questions about how do you design that? How do you know about aerodynamics without... That? I'm not sure what your background is educationally, which actually tell us, but then, you know, like aerodynamics is a pretty engineering intensive application materials is as well. There's a lot that goes into designing a rim. Right. And, uh, when we first designed our own molds, uh, we started in 2011. It was for the wheels that we released in 2013 and with the rim shapes there, in all honesty, we got really lucky with the rim shapes, uh, being aerodynamically as good or better than some of the other you know, top players on the market. Uh, it was just sort of me doing napkin sketches, changing around enough to where uh, it, I felt like we had a good rim shape and it proved to be a fast rim design. So it was like totally pure luck or did your manufacturing partners help with the aerodynamics at all? It was totally pure luck. <laughs> well, congratulations. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And then, so since then, have you done wind tunnel testing and everything to verify? Yeah, so now what we do is um, carbon molds, uh, or the molds to make carbon rims are very expensive. And, you know, we got lucky on three models in 2013. We don't want to go through that again because making a mistake is multi-thousand dollar mistake. And so now whenever we're going to design a rim shape, we do months worth of CFD, computer fluid dynamic analysis, and we're going through lots of different run simulations and when we find the best ones we actually make a physical prototype of the wheel and you had featured that on one of your stories it was like a 50, 50 pounds or something 50, it was a 15 pound wheel and we bring it to all the trade shows and we would bring that to the wind tunnel to actually test it against uh, all the other top aero wheel companies out there to validate the CFD findings once we're happy with that wind tunnel result then we open up the mold to produce the carbon rims so was it your first proprietary rim was carbon versus alloy or something? Correct. Was that easy, easier to jump straight into a composite versus extruding a metal rim? Uh, it's just finding the right suppliers. And uh, so if you have a, a custom alloy shape uh, or a custom carbon shape, it's just finding the manufacturer who can support opening up the new molds for you and then delivering new product. So what was the... I mean, it sounds like part of the business decision was that you wanted to offer something unique to set yourselves apart. But the other side of that question for me is, how did you know there was demand for a Boyd wheel? I mean, even when we were selling the open mold stuff, we kept seeing our demand going up. We kept uh, doubling the size of the company. Um, you know, from 2010 to 2011, we tripled the size of the company. Um, it was definitely the demand was there and a lot of it was just you know people knew that there was good customer service with the wheel sets if there happened to be a problem uh, we would get it resolved right away and then we would catch a lot of the problems doing the QC that you know might deter people from buying direct from a Chinese manufacturer right so we're gonna jump around or kind of progress in your wheel design and then jump back to some other stuff for the rims or even the complete wheels, where do you come up with the, the concepts for new models? How much of it is 
reactionary like you know gravel riding and plus size mountain bikes are a big thing right now and you're introducing wheels for both of those how much of it is that kind of reaction to what the market's doing versus hey we've got this really killer idea for something new well if you have a killer idea for something new with the wheel you got to make sure that there's a bike to put it on and so we are seeing you know certain trends in the industry uh, I try to stay really in tune with what the consumer is doing um, as far as riding their bikes. We're seeing road cycling, the traditional road cycling, sort of on a decline right now. Other stuff, uh, gravel is definitely on a rise. Uh, mountain biking is getting more on a rise. Basically anything that's keeping people out of traffic uh, is where the cycling market is headed to right now. And in all honesty, you know, the wheels that we're designing, it's still for the type of riding that I'm doing. I'm a self-confessed wheel junkie, and so the fact that we have a plus-size mountain bike wheel that we're starting to work on, I just got a plus-size mountain bike, and so I'd really like something to ride. With this, uh, you know, we were talking before the interview about standards and how the standards, <clears throat> particularly, well, for both road and mountain, have really changed a lot over the last couple of years, and it's potentially deterred customers from buying a new bike because they weren't quite sure where it would settle out. They didn't want to buy something that was going to be obsolete in a year or two. And so you mentioned a standard. I'll let you say what it is if you want that <laughs> you think is coming. Uh, how do you gauge what's going to be coming a year or two or even three from today because, like you said, your first carbon rim, it took you two years about to go from concept to a finished product. So you have to know what's two years out. Yep, and uh, that's, you know, analyzing trends, uh, being in tune with, uh, it's a very small industry. And uh, so being in tune with a lot of people in the industry, seeing, you know, what are, what are uh, the companies working on that's going to be, you know, two, three years down the line. And the companies will talk to each other. Um, because nobody wants to release a bike that there's not a wheel set for and vice versa. And so just staying in tune with the demands of the customer, talking with the you know, other companies in the industry and determining where are we headed as a complete industry. So if somebody's starting up a component company, you know, wheel cranks, whatever, just pick a part or, or it doesn't even have to be in bikes, right? Like if somebody's working on a widget that mm -hmm is part of a bigger widget, you know, like wheels to a bike, how would they go about figuring out what's going on? You know, do you just, like when you were first starting out, could you have just gone to say Specialized or Trek and said, hey guys, uh, what are you working on for three years from now? Because I want to make a part for that. <laughs> no, it's uh, definitely not with a company like that. But I, I make the joke all the time that the entire cycling industry is ran out of a bar in a hotel lobby in downtown Taichung. And when you're over there and you happen to be sitting down with product managers and a couple beers start happening, uh, stuff just starts, you know, you start talking about the industry and um, that's really how, you know, the whole Taichung Bike Week got started, which is where brands are planning their, you know, next year or two year down the line uh, model launch. So go to the trade shows and ask where the after parties are or where people are going for a drink. Right. Follow the crowds. Yep. <laughs> right, huh? Okay. Other than looking at trends and saying, okay, well, there's a, a growing market for X, say gravel bikes in this case, uh, where else do you get your inspiration for new products? Uh, just personally riding. I still love riding my bike. Um, and it's really, if there's a type of riding that you know, I'm interested in doing, it's, uh, we're going to design a great wheel for it. Do you guys solicit rider feedback? You know, not necessarily people you sponsor, but like, you know, consumer surveys or anything like that? Um, not necessarily. We've got a great riding community here in Greenville. Um, and I'm in tune still with a lot of riders uh, throughout the country. I've got a lot of good connections from my racing days. And so there's a lot of emails that go back and forth because the type of riding in South Carolina is different than what's out in California. California tends to be ahead of us uh, in terms of willingness to adapt to new technology. Hmm. Is it something where you might actually want a different wheel or a different build to that wheel for 
East Coast versus West Coast or something like that? Or uh, With the mountain bikes, yeah, I mean, it's uh, different types of, you know, there's a lot more rocks and drops out on the West Coast, and so that's where we're looking at, um, you know, different types of wheels for different markets. Okay. All right, let's talk about a project that you worked on for a long time that ended up not coming to market, your Eternity Hubs. Mm -hmm. And if I remember right, because it's been a couple years now, I think, the one of the, the big things with this was getting really, really tight tolerances and super smooth bearing rolling. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it was a... On concept, it was a great hub design. Uh, we basically made two axles in the rear hub, uh, one to support the free hub body, one to support the hub shell, and it was a system where uh, it spaced the load bearings very far apart, and it made it where when you were pedaling, only two of the four bearings would spin. So what happened? Uh, it relied on super tight tolerances, and uh, unfortunately, the company that we were working with to do the CNC manufacturing uh, we just could not hit the tolerances needed, and uh, so we ended up, we did bring it to market, and uh, we did a voluntary recall and got every hub back and replaced for the customers that we sold them to. So was it just a matter of the design relied on manufacturing that just wasn't feasible? Uh, there was a lot of... Uh, red flags that I should have been looking at that I kind of ignored um, and I think that uh, with some slight modifications to the design and the right design partner I think that we could uh, we could bring it back but at the same time we've got great hubs right now it's a very stable product we've also partnered with uh, White Industries and offer their hubs so we've got a great hub options uh, both on our stock and the White Industries and Honestly, there's no reason to move forward with anything other than that right now. What were some of the red flags that you should have paid attention to? Uh, just when I was getting samples, uh, samples would be different between, even on the same batch, uh, one hub would have uh, some play in the bearings, whereas the others wouldn't. Um, the free hub bodies were set at different lengths, and there was just stuff that wasn't consistent that we would hope would shake out in the manufacturing process. Right on. And so the hubs that you offer now, uh, with your your branded hub, so is that your own design as well? Yes, um, and that's uh, you know obviously the um, the place that's making the hubs. Um, you know it's the CNC facility there. We gave them the drawings, specified uh, how the preload works on it, the free hub body engagement system, uh, how many teeth on the engagement uh, ring, and uh, but then the manufacturing happens uh, over in Taiwan for our hubs. Okay. As far as other brands, because the open mold progression where people come in, you know, like, I, I mean, I can think of two right off the top that have done the same thing. You know, Hermes Sport has done it. Uh, Chris over at Mercury Wheels has done it. You know, they all started the same way and now they have their own mm -hmm. rims and uh, in some cases hubs as well. What, when you see those kinds of competitions and then especially like when you have huge companies like Mavic that have been doing it for a long time, mm -hmm. how do you differentiate yourself? It's a, uh, I mean a smaller company is always going to be more agile and uh, easier to uh, adapt to new change in technologies <clears throat> and with uh, you know with the cycling industry sort of changing standards every couple of years on parts, it's those smaller companies that can adapt um, that are actually having the advantage right now. For the marketing that you guys do, how do you get the word out about your wheels? Uh, it's actually through our customers. Uh, our customers are wonderful, um, and a lot of them are so happy with the wheels, with the performance, uh, with the price point of them, that they go in there, they tell their friends. Uh, pretty much every bike shop that we've opened throughout the country, and we're up to about 250 now, uh, has come on board because a customer of theirs has asked them to start carrying the wheels. Do you guys sell direct, or does it have to go through a shop? We sell both direct and through bike shops. Okay. And what? Because you go to events as well. You're going to the Handmade Bike Show. You're going to mm -hmm. Sea Otter Classic, which are both huge consumer events. Mm -hmm. Do you? How much value do you get out of that, and how do you get value out of going to those? Uh, being able to go to an event and actually talk to a consumer is probably... Uh, the biggest return on investment that we can do as a company. Um, 
you know, going to a show like NABS, we'll end up talking to a couple thousand people over three days, and each one of those people is a potential customer. Is it, it's hard to scale something like that though. Right, uh, cloning technology is still not uh, <laughs> there yet. And uh, so we are working on bringing on more people. Um, we just brought on a guy in San Diego who uh, we were very fortunate enough. Uh, Richard Wittenberg came on board um, over from Ridley and he's helping us a lot with uh, the sales, uh, the marketing, international distribution. And so it's finding the pieces to put into place to make it where we can be at events that my wife Nicole and myself can't always attend. How many people do you have working here now? There's eight of us here. Okay. When you first started, was it you building the wheels? Uh, it was. I, I would actually lace them up, and our first employee was a wheel builder. And uh, so I would sit in my living room uh, watching TV, lacing up wheels, and then I would drop it off at her house, and uh, uh, we would pay her on a uh, per-wheel basis, and I would pick them up a couple of days later. All right. So how long was it before you got an office? Um, was right about, let's see, my wife was pregnant, so I'd say it was about a year and a half we finally moved out of our house, <laughs> and uh, our first office was a cinder block building with no heat, no AC, uh, it had a bathroom, but there was no hot water heater, and uh, it was 2,000 square feet that we were renting for $400 a month, and it was perfect for us at the time, um, and we were living, you know, very frugally then as a company, just making sure that, you know, whatever we could do was to keep uh, the pricing as low as possible. All right. And did the wheel builder at that time, did they come into that office and build or were they still doing it from home or had you grown by then? We had grown by then. And so uh, when we were in that building, uh, we quickly went from one wheel builder to then three. And that's right about that 2011, 2012 point when we started really growing as a company. All right, and then when did you move into the current place and how big is this building? Uh, so in 2012, we moved into a building uh, just down the Swamp Rabbit Trail from where we are now, and uh, that was 1,500 square feet. So we actually downsized a little bit, but it was in a cool location. We shared a building with uh, an organic cafe, and uh, we were right on the Swamp Rabbit Trail. Uh, we stayed there for about three years, and then we were able to purchase the current building that we're in which is a 10,000 square foot warehouse. Nice, and was it, it's a killer building, it's a killer location that we're <laughs> in now. Is it, did you buy it because you needed the space? Because there's a lot of empty space here too, which is, gives it a nice open air feeling, but it seems like you've got a ton of room to grow. We've got the room to grow. Uh, the building we got for a great deal and it's in a great location. So uh, the fact that we own the building is going to be great for, you know, down the line when it's time to move the wheel building business out of here someplace else. When you hired a wheel builder full time for the first time or some any other employee for the first time, like was that a scary leap to go to paying somebody's salary or were you guys doing well enough that you're like, okay, yeah, this it, no was, it was definitely scary because the wheel builder we hired had a full-time job at a bike shop. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing when it's yourself that you're taking the risk on. But when you start taking risk on other people, uh, taking them out of jobs, uh, that's when it becomes a little bit real. Um, but we were very busy and we were very confident that we could pay a salary. And uh, we actually, uh, three wheel builders um, that we've been working with have bought houses as we've been employing them. So that's something really cool to see. Nice. So as you guys continue to grow, <clears throat> it's, you, we mentioned before the show too, like because of all those standards changing uh, on, for both road and mountain bikes that the market's a little bit down for new bike sales right now. Does that mean business is better for you because people are just upgrading the bikes they have or are they still waiting out to see where the axle standards are go before they buy a new wheel? I think, uh, yeah, people were definitely in a wait and see approach last year. Uh, just through our growth, uh, you know, we were able to grow about 20% last year and the industry as a whole was down, I think about 25 to 30%. And so that's, you know, great for us. But I think that was a, just a lot of our continued growth pattern. Uh, I think that as stuff starts to even out in terms of, you know, new axle standards and disc brake sizes and um, our bike's going to be coming with disc brakes and all that. I think the consumer's now going to be on more of a buying pattern coming up. 
Where do you see the growth coming from? Is it just people adding a second or third set of wheels for some reason? Or are you stealing market share from somebody else? It's a combination of a lot of stuff. Um, there's definitely market share that we're taking from other companies. Um, but I, st I think uh, you know a lot of our customers have bought a bike recently and it came with the stock OEM wheels on it and they're just looking for that next upgrade. And we sell a lot of wheels to people who are looking to basically make their ride better. For the sales growth, is it, do you see that coming mostly through retail channels, more direct or more international growth? Uh, right now we're trying to find that good combination of all three. Uh, we are working on getting international distribution and Recently, we've just opened up distributors in Scandinavia and Benelux with uh, potential markets opening in Japan and Australia as well. Um, we're also in the U.S. Uh, working on a good balance between dealer sales and direct-to-consumer sales. We want to work with the dealers, but not exclusively, as we still need that customer base. Right. Is it, do you get blowback from the, from the independent bike shops because you sell direct? No, nope. uh, we really strictly follow our uh, map pricing. We don't put our stuff on sale, and we ask that the bike shops don't put it on sale either. And so it's a good harmony. A bike shop in you know central Chicago is not going to care if we sell a wheel set to somebody in North Dakota. Uh, if a bike shop is doing well, we do like to push the sales through them. Right. So for international, how did you find the distributors? Uh, they've been emailing us, and so... Uh, Marketing internationally has been kind of tough for us. Uh, we've been more successful, obviously, in the United States, but uh, as a company, we're starting to get a little bit more worldwide attention, and that's where some of the distributors have started reaching out to us. Right. With those, how do you vet them? You know, if a distributor calls you from, say, Germany, how would you decide if they're good or not? <laughs> Right now, uh, I mean, until recently, we wouldn't have had a clue. We would have just had to email back and forth a bunch. With Richard uh, Wittenberg coming on board, he's got a lot of ties with distributors, and he's actually approaching them versus relying on them approaching us. For the domestic sales, did you guys just immediately spread out? I mean, assuming you set up a website when you first started to a, a very, very basic website. Right. Um, one of the things is I've basically had to do everything which and uh, I didn't have the experience so I had to learn how to make a website when we started I had to learn how to do accounting stuff when we started uh, I basically went into opening up the business without knowing anything about running a business <laughs> as many of us do yes <laughs> <laughs> the so those initial sales on your when you were just doing custom wheel building was that mostly to like friends and local area sales yeah it was uh <laughs> We definitely had a very southeast presence, and we would meet people at bike races and deliver wheels. Um, and it was a lot of people that, you know, either we knew personally or we knew through friends. Um, and that's how we got started. I would say when that in that first year, probably eighty percent of our sales were within a four-hour drive. And is it still pretty strong in the southeast, or is it more evenly spread out now? It's starting to spread out. Uh, we still have a great presence in the southeast. Uh, it's starting to spread into New England pretty good. Um, and, you know, if you look at our dealer locator on our website, you can see kind of the path that we've taken in expanding. Right. Do you find that the further you get away from the South Carolina headquarters, it's a little bit harder to support that, or is it not It's not issue? harder to support. We can still support the dealers very well, and that's why we've started seeing some growth in the Pacific Northwest and California. It's just that's where you know the bike shops haven't heard of Boyd in those situations. Do you see? Well, how do you get the word of those shops in the other areas? Or do you guys use a distributor for the U.S.? No, nope, we self-distribute in the U.S. Uh, right now, it's uh, we've been fortunate enough. You know, we've had a lot of great reviews recently, and so when we call up a dealer who may have never heard of us, we can point to some of the reviews in uh, some of the cycling publications and. Uh, you know, get them to at least see that we're not just a, you know, mom and pop shop. Right. How about the trade shows? Is there still value in the 
the the retail and industry side trade shows like Interbike or Eurobike? Yeah, um, and we're planning on doing both again this year. Um, especially with Interbike being you know more on the West Coast, we see a lot of the dealers that you know they'll stop by our booth, and we'll usually have about twenty sets of wheels standing in our booth, so that gets a lot of attention. Um, you know those shops. They're all potential customers, so anytime you can reach a potential customer, it's a good investment. What's your elevator pitch to them when they walk by? It's uh, you get all the performance or even better performance at usually a fraction of the price. What are some of the biggest challenges you face, and what did you do to overcome them? Uh, just growth. I mean, it's we're still a really small company. Getting the marketing message out there without the millions of dollars of advertising budget. Um, you know, we can't fly journalists to a private island to do a wheel <laughs> launch. Um, and so it's, you know, reaching that consumer um, in a very limited budget. So what do you do to overcome that? Uh, that's where, you know, doing the events helps. Um, you know, having great customers really helps because that word of mouth from friends is the best possible advertising you can get. Uh, we are starting to grow enough to where we are doing, you know, Facebook advertising, really marketing to the consumer and then using them to sort of pull the bike shops into it. What's some of the best advice you've received? have fun <laughs> so it's uh we have fun every day that we're working here and it's very hard work um but i wake up every morning looking forward to it uh try to still ride my bike every day and uh when i ride my bike i work better and so you know what we're doing is it's a lot of fun still to me uh we're very fortunate we uh we've got a great group of mentors here in greenville we're actually part of a a business incubator program and we receive mentorship through uh, actually through MIT College um, with various companies here in town we meet once a month with established business leaders and we go over you know what are some of our challenges what are um, you know what's going good what's going bad how can we make stuff better all right so if you had to give advice to somebody that wants to start <laughs> up a consumer products company what would you say Consum uh, Customer service is key. Um, you know, it's if you make somebody happy, they're going to tell five people. If you make them upset, they're going to tell everybody. Just uh, whatever you're going to do, stand behind it 100%. Right on. So where can people connect with Boyd Cycling or you? Yeah, uh, our website is www.boydcycling.com. And then uh, we've got Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all at Boyd Cycling. Right on. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. One of the challenges with high-end bicycle wheels these days is that so many of them are so good. It's hard to call a 2000 wheel set a commodity, but the truth is, it's very hard to differentiate yourself purely on product in that space. That's where customer service comes in, and that's what's helped Boyd grow. I found it funny that he basically lucked into a good aero shape on his first round of rim designs. For any entrepreneur, luck helps accelerate growth or save the day now and then, but it's not a strategy. The reality is you make your own luck. Boyd hustled with his wheel building business to get to a point where he could produce his own carbon rim design. That wasn't luck, that was hard work. And once he had that fortunate design sitting in his warehouse, it took more hard work to sell them. I've written a lot about finding a pain point and creating a solution for that as a foundation for your own product or service. For Boyd, he was, his was racing wheels when he was a pro. Generally speaking, brands use their sponsored athletes as guinea pigs, but there are times where the products the pros really like and want don't translate to normal people. Top athletes place demands on products that the rest of us will never replicate, so it's worth testing concepts on regular people too. As always, thanks for tuning in. If you just found us, head to iTunes or Stitcher and subscribe. And if you could leave us a quick rating and review, that helps me grow this podcast and do more killer interviews. You'll find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Build Cycle. And check out the show notes and links and more from this episode on the blog at thebuildcycle.com. Until next time, keep the rubber side down.